Baylor College of Medicine and friends of Baylor. Well, you know, things were looking too good. So the CDC just let us know that there's a Marburg out, uh, outbreak in Rwanda. So there have been 38 cases as of October 1st, and 11 have died. Marburg is an interesting virus. It's one of those hemorrhagic fever viruses. There's been an outbreak in Rwanda in a lot of the larger cities, the city of Kigali, for example, uh, seven different districts, and uh, some of the larger hospitals. So it's, a lot of times caregivers are infected. You might ask yourself, where is Kigali? It is in Rwanda, which is right next to Burundi, and you can see there. Uh, and so why would they name it Marburg virus, you ask? I would, I would ask. Well, it's named after the, uh, the discovery of the virus in 1967, after it caused a bunch of outbreaks in lab workers in Marburg, Germany. So there's where Marburg, Germany is, nowhere near Rwanda. But seven people died from that outbreak, and as a result, it's been called the Marburg virus. As I mentioned, it's a lot like Ebola. It's a hemorrhagic fever. People have high, uh, very high fevers, muscle aches, uh, often di uh, vomiting and severe headaches, malaise. Uh, and in some cases, people have so much hemorrhage that they actually die from their blood loss. There is currently no vaccine, but there are two vaccines in development, and there's presumption that some of the antivirals might work against these viruses. The fatality rate's very high, 88%. There have been cases in neighboring uh, Tanzania and Uganda, and basically what happens is it's, it, it is another one of those things that lives in bats. It's transmitted uh, from bat to people from the Egyptian Rousset fruit bat, which is a very large bat. Bats are getting a bad name. They harbor everything. Anyway, bat infects a man, and then from people, it's transmitted pe person to person through uh, contact with bodily fluids. Uh, so often, if people are close or get in contact with blood, in some cases, uh, from instruments that have, uh, where people have, uh, instruments have been in contact with people, or when uh, people have died from the disease during the burial process if you're not really careful and you get in contact with the person, uh, it's a real problem. So the, it's because of the number of cases, uh, both the WHO and the CDC have put out an alert, mainly for people like uh, institutions where you may be having folks traveling from Rwanda. All right, so medical centers who have staff that are from there need to be uh, very clear for that there's not a problem and, and it's from temporary isolation. Uh, West Nile has continued to be a huge problem in the U.S. Almost all the states, 46 states are now reporting cases. We had almost 1,000 cases, 684 neuroinvasive disease. Uh, that means probably there's been probably 6,000 cases because it's usually 1 in 10 that get neuroinvasive, but they've only reported about 1,000. So it's vastly underreported. In Harris County alone, in Texas, our county, uh, there have been 11 cases, but 23 uh, samples from blood donors have turned out positive. So again, so that means a lot of people are getting infected, but not everyone is manifesting the disease entirely. And of course, in Maryland, there have been 19 cases, and probably the most prominent one is the mosquito that got Tony Fauci in his backyard. You don't have to go far to get your own. <laughs> These are all, you know, mosquito bites that are local, close to you. Mosquitoes don't travel far. So you know TEFI, we love TEFI, that's the Texas-wide ep um, epidemiology program following infectious diseases. Uh, West Nile continues to be uh, pretty high in Texas and now has been detected in El Paso. Uh, most of the viral news is good. Enterovirus D68 has been around most of the summer, I, you know, I mentioned that was like a summer virus, summer colds. Most of the summer colds have been uh, D68. A little bit later ha have been COVID, but SARS-CoV-2 is really dropping dramatically. Uh, parvovirus is down, Echo 11 is down. So really the only problem virus right now is uh, West Nile and enterovirus. That's the news from Texas. So the national news on COVID is that if you look at the wastewater, it's really come down. So it sort of peaked. Uh, in August, it's come down steadily since then. Emergency room visits are down, and that's the leading indicator. Hospitalizations, a lagging indicator, they're also coming down. And the predominant strain is the one that has been around uh, 
last month, KP3.1 is now 59% of all the viral variants that are there. I just want to point out JN1, last year's major variant, it sort of disappeared in this country in around July. If you look at the Travelers program that looks at uh, wastewater from airplanes and airports, so people coming into this country, it's coming down, but there's been some spikes. The interesting thing is if you look what the viral the variants are from there, JN1 is still pretty prominent. So as I said, I think most of this evolution of the K, the, the recent ones have come, have been from replication in the United States, not coming from other countries. A lot of people have asked me, like, what do you do if you're positive? Because we've had a lot of people show up positive. So they, the recommendations have changed a lot. Pretty much you stay home until you're feeling better. Uh, it's best to be home uh, until you have 24 hours without a fever or without symptoms. If you don't have symptoms, even if you're positive, it's very unlikely that you'll really transmit the virus. So if you're positive but, not, you know, not too many symptoms, probably try and stay away from people. And, you know, it doesn't mean you have to stay home, but stay away from crowds and maybe wear a mask. But it's not like it was before where you need to have mandatory isolation. So just so you know, stay home until you're feeling better, asymptomatic, and 24 hours without a fever. Same thing we do for flu. Exactly the same recommendations for flu. The good news is flu season hasn't started yet, but it will. We just haven't had it yet, but probably later this, you know, October, November, December, that's when it really picks up. Uh, reports of the bird flu, avian flu, H5N1. California now reported two cases. Same kind of thing. They were in workers that were dealing with animals, two dairy workers in California. Uh, in the Central Valley region, uh, there have been 16 human cases so far this year of avian flu. All of them have been the same, kind of conjunctivitis, little sniffles, not too bad, haven't yet uh, transmitted person to person. Right now, we can, the CDC continues to say the risk for an average person is low, but if you're in either the poultry industry or the dairy industry, they're saying it's significantly higher and you should be wearing protective equipment. So that's a big difference. As I said, I think we probably ought to be vaccinating cattle, but we'll wait and see. The sad thing about H5N1, we, I've talked about it being in sea lions a few years ago, now in dairy cattle. Unfortunately, it also is in big cats. So in Vietnam, 47 tigers died and three lions and a panther also died from avian flu, probably from infected chicken meat that was fed to them. Now, last week I got a, a, a question, can you get it from chicken? And I said, it's unlikely. Uh, I still think it's unlikely because the way it's processed and steamed and all that kind of stuff, but it's not impossible. I mean, here's a, obviously the these animals all died from eating infected chicken meat, so that's unfortunate. Anyway, I want to end today with a bunch of shout outs. First of all, uh, congratulations to Dr. Blair Benham Pyle, Dr. Steve Boenums, and Dr. Hong Shay Lee, who've been awarded the National Institutes of Health Director's New Innovation Innovators Award. This award is part of the NIH Common Fund's High Risk, High Reward Research Program for Innovative Research for Early Career Awardees. Uh, that they each received $2.4 million to support their work. So congratulations to all three of them. Also, congratulations to Dr. Shekadamian. She's the chair of the Department of Pediatrics and Pediatrician in Chief at Texas Children. She won the Distinguished Career Award from the American Academy of Pedi Pediatrics. It's a real honor. And congratulations to Dr. Nancy Booty, who, who uh, an emeritus professor of pediatrics, who received the Samuel Foman Nutrition Award. Uh, next week, we have the Baylor College of Medicine Alumni Association Awards, and we will honor 10 Baylor College of Medicine alumni uh, and faculty for their career, in, uh, their career accomplishments in innovative research. Uh, Dr. Bud Frazier, the class of 67, professor in the DeBakey Department of Surgery at Baylor and co-director of the Center for Preclinical Surgical Interventional Research at the Texas Heart Institute, will receive the Lifetime Achievement Award. He has been a major leader in the development of a, a mechanical heart. Uh, we have other awardees that will include uh, Samitri Agarwal, Kelly Cohen-Fine, Benjamin Frankfurt, Giaconda Guadiano, Amy Langley, Atul Maheshwari, Joe Pet Petrosino, Mark Uden, and Jack Zenefeld. So congratulations to all those faculty who won awards. October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month, so members of the Baylor community are invited to show their support by wearing pink next Friday 
And today is uh, uh, Yom Kippur uh, this evening. It is a, a day of atonement that we observe uh, for all of you who are uh, of the faith. Uh, anyway, have a wonderful weekend. I can't wait to see you next week. Thank you.